Hey everyone. All right, so this is going to be uh, just a quick little um, kind of walkthrough about um, uh, some of the some of this stuff is going to be stuff that Owen taught me when I was first learning digital painting about a year ago, um, and uh, and doing this tree project and then most of the rest of it is going to be stuff that uh, Pablo Rivera, some advice that he gave me when it turned out that I was kind of crap at the stuff that Owen was teaching me. Um, so I already uploaded the, or I, I, I would have, I've already taken and I should post uh, the short little clip from a Disney um, kind of featurette about uh, the art behind Sleeping Beauty, and specifically the part where Ivan Earl paints that bush, um, which is, it's fantastic, and it, it it's totally, um, uh, I don't know what the word is, I've forgotten, I'm blanking because I'm talking into my mic alone. Um, <laughs> It reinforces everything that we learn in our painting classes right now. Ivan was painting with gouache there, um, and he was going from dark to light, um, adding big shapes and then moving down to smaller details. And that's basically all this is going to be. Um, and I'm going to reinforce it with some contemporary artists. First of all, these shapes right here, um, this is from a little process breakdown that Rob Ruppel, uh, a concept artist behind, among other things, Spider-Verse, uh, posted to one of his blogs. Um, and he starts out with these really, really basic shapes in four tones. Um, and then he adjusts the composition. He would have been painting this plein air. He'd post a lot of digital plein air work, and this is some of his best, and thank God he put this break down here because it's wonderful. Um, so he adjusted the composition. Um, and then he added color, and you can start seeing what everything is. And he's also at this point using um, using temperature to recede stuff in into the background. So like this is way far in the back. It's atmospheric perspective. It's all the stuff we learned in any twelve. Um, so then next step, uh, some light in the front. This is. I don't know if this was actually here, but he's giving the composition a little bit more stuff going on in the foreground because there's not a lot there uh more details some cars some more trees but what i mostly just want us to pay attention now to is this tree in fact i'm going to zoom in on it um the jpeg compression is not the best but you're still going to be able to tell really clearly what he's doing um so we're painting trees right uh and painting trees is really tough because they've got so much detail in them um, but this is a really great breakdown about like basically what's going on. Um, so he starts out with this shape. Uh, it's simple. You can kind of tell where the light's coming from because it's got two tones and one is obviously in shadow. Um, then boom, the actual tree shapes. Uh, the leaves are still just these big blocks, but then he's got this branch that he's like shaping. And then the next step is, uh, he's cutting into those blocks. He's kind of figuring out what the uh, details are going to look like for the leaves because obviously we don't live in wherever Dr. Seuss lives and uh, the trees aren't just circles. Excuse me. So um, we went from here to here and now we're going from here to here. The next step is a little bit more lighting. Uh, you can see other stuff's going on in the background, but we don't need to pay attention to that. Um, a little bit more lighting. He's showing where uh, some of the holes within the tree are lighting it, and then he's showing where some of the uh, where the leaves are shading the tree. The light is coming from upper right, uh, and if that wasn't already clear by the shadows on the leaves, then now it's super super clear. That's exactly where it is, and we're getting a little bit more detail in the trunk. Nothing. And then this is kind of like the oh, paint the rest of the goddamn tree moment. Um, we go from here to here. Uh, but you notice that none of the actual uh, shapes changed. 
it was all exactly the same and that's because he was using that masking technique that i taught before um so all he's doing now is painting on top of this stuff and he's using like a bunch of different textures but really all it is are these square and kind of sharp shapes that kind of stand in for the leaves um and what he's doing is he's adding this texture almost exclusively in the area where the f form changes and where the light turns to shadow right the uh the core shadow or right before the core shadow right around here and right around here that's where all the texture goes because that's where you notice the most change in detail because that's where the, there's the most contrast like there are going to be leaves there that are totally in shadow and leaves that are totally in light and so that's where you're going to find the most difference with the leaves uh this paying attention to this and keeping this in mind is the number one way that you make sure that your tree doesn't look too busy um, because trust me when you first start painting it it's going to look too busy you're going to want to put in every single little detail and that's just not possible I tried uh, my tree for this project sucked Ex precisely because I was trying to do that um, so uh, Rupel he's mostly keeping everything uh, contiguous in the shadow, doing a little bit more work, but still mostly keeping everything contiguous on the light side. He's almost doing almost all his work where those changes happen, where those two sides meet. Um, and then there, there are some highlights that are kind of scattered along the top. Obviously, you're not going to get like one big egg highlight right here. Um, they're going to be you know, they're going to be the highlights on all the different leaves. Um, and then he keeps on going. He adjusts the temperature and just light, light touch-ups, which that'll be the, uh, that'll be the end of any process you do. Um, so like he's breaking up the form a little bit more. This is a layer that he used on top of that masking layer that I talked about. Um, you can tell because he's moving stuff around and he's not necessarily uh like only going into the tree shape um and like that's that's basically it that's how you get from that lollipop shape to um an actual tree now uh, i want to talk a little bit more about some of his other uh plein air work like like i said he does a lot of digital plein air eh, digital plein air um stuff like this uh but you can see like probably uh this this probably went a lot faster this is a lot kind of sketchier and kind of more traditional looking than the other stuff uh, but you can see still the same exact stuff is happening everything's blending together in the dark everything's blending together in the light all the work's being done all around the form um there the uh, branches are visible through the tree. A little bit of the background is visible through the tree. Um, those uh, little uh, light windows, sky windows, sky holes, I don't remember what Inga calls them, but Inga talks much better about those than I do, so I'm going to abstain. Um, but same stuff. I basically grabbed all of his plein air stuff that has trees in it. Um, these are really sketched in. This whole thing probably took the guy like 20 minutes at the max probably 10 um but yeah more trees he's using texture brushes here just to indicate stuff without like doing any work uh texture brushes are really great for that here's one of the more polished ones and you can see he's using the exact same techniques he blocked it out then he cut into it and then he uh painted all of the detail right where the light changes on all of these even on the bushes uh, this is like this is just the way that you paint or it's one of the ways I'm not gonna call it the one way but it's the way you paint complex shapes and uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about Ivan Doral's stuff later and you'll see it's basically the same thing um, more trees these are really sketchy this this is super sketchy but it's still totally clear exactly what's going on um, more trees again just scribbled in there if he was doing this traditionally he could have done it with a crayon and it would have come out awesome 
not much in the way of trees here. You can see the very bottom. Um, the thing that I like about this is you can see that he's using super soft brushes in addition to really hard brushes. Um, like uh, this looks super hard. This looks like he's only using like a square. Um, but once you know like what to do, then um, you can use any methods you want. Just don't re don't over rely on textured brushes because it's going to make your painting look kind of like you stamped it out. Um, and then this one's this one's really crazy. Uh, he's using a ton of like like really messy textured brushes. He's he's using a ton of um, really soft brushes, but you can still tell exactly what's happening, and you still got that detail where the form changes. Uh, whereas this is just like a blob. Um, and yeah, more stuff. Yeah, it's a broken record at this point. This is this is how uh, one of my favorite digital artists, who's really digital, whose work is intensely digital paints trees um and then here i pulled up um that painting that ivandora was doing at the beginning of the video about um about the about painting the bush except this one this is the one that he was doing at the originally where he's painting the trunk and you can see the time lapse of him going from just a black block to this trunk by like painting in black and then painting on top of it um and you can see that all of this foliage this is very stylized but it's still readable and you can still tell what's going on all of this foliage was painted the exact same way that rob rupo painted the tree and that ivan Durrell painted that bush in the uh in the sleeping beauty thing it's just there's a little bit more kind of stylized um kind of stamped on detail because of the Sleeping Beauty style that he developed for that movie. Um, but it's basically the same thing. It's dark and then light on top. And then most of the most of the really legible detail is where the, the form changes. Um, and then you can use that to your advantage, like with these knots in the tree. You can use them to illustrate exactly where the light's coming from. Because the clearer you are, the more readable your image is going to be. Um, just don't make sure, make sure that none of it's clashing. Make sure all of the information you're telling the viewer is the same. Um, that's going to be it for what I have for now. Um, I might try and demo this later, depending upon what Inga thinks of this information. Um, I might not. Uh, I've got, <laughs> oh God, I've got so much other homework to do aside from this. But um, I'm happy to uh, lend what I learned last year when I was going through this class. Uh, good luck to everyone. Stay safe. Uh, practice social distancing. And I'll see you in the next class. Here is Ivan Earl. He created the unique styling and overall appearance of our production, Sleeping Beauty. In searching for a style for a cartoon feature, many considerations are necessary. For one thing, it must be more than merely pleasing to the eye. The backgrounds must harmonize with the animated characters, as well as fit the mood of the story and the music. Sleeping Beauty is a fairy tale that is supposed to have taken place long, long ago. So we did a great amount of research into medieval painting and architecture before we arrived at the right styling for this picture. This is Walt Paragoy, who is an artist with a very distinctive style of his own, which is entirely different from Ivan's. But I had to forego my normal manner of painting because all the scenes of an animated film must be kept consistent in appearance. So like all the other background artists, I look to Ivan to help me keep my background paintings in line with the established style of the picture. This entire operation puts one in mind of a symphony orchestra where men who are good enough to be soloists in their own right are thinking only of the effect they are producing on the whole. This sort of deferring to what is most important in achieving a common goal affects every individual in the studio while he is at work. But in his leisure time, he can be himself. No longer a member of a group, but a virtuoso, an individualist, suiting only himself.